Um, let, oh, awesome, Anna. Um, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Jorge Penarumba Rubia, who is um, a member of the faculty at the University of Edinburgh. Um, before that, uh, he did his PhD in Heidelberg and held positions um, at the Max Planck Institute, at the University of Victoria, and at the University of the original Cambridge. Um, and, uh, and wow, I, I was so consumed with my joke that I lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, Jorge is an uh, expert in, I, I, I guess we'll, we'll find out if this is a fair characterization, but like using stars as tracers of the underlying sort of dark matter dynamics that, that um, our galaxy and others um, enclose. So without further ado, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, where is it? it? was open before. Here. Uh, right. and, sure. so, and I also meant to say that um, when with when there's five minutes to go, um, Anna has a, a bell sound that she'll play. All right. So can you see my screen yep. and, and the cursor? Yep. Perfect. All right. So let me start then. So today's talk, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, I should say. Sorry. And so, so today's talk is going to be about uh, dark matter substructure and uh, whether or not uh, um, we can use it to put constraints on uh, cold dark matter particles with uh, very masses above uh, giga electron volts. So we're, we're going to go and look at the very fine detail uh, of uh, our galactic uh, dark matter halo. Uh, okay, so I've seen, you, everyone has seen this picture so many times, I'm not going to explain what is in here, but uh, what I would like to draw your attention is to the fact that the lambda CDM model is a classical model in the sense that it uses classical physics. There is no exotic physics, there is no new physics in, this, in our paradigm. Dark matter behaves as a perfect fluid uh, which only interacts through gravity. So, and we really see no uh, deviation from this classical picture uh, all the way down to very high uh, moments here, you can see uh, of the cosmic mi microwave background. So in principle, uh, with the data at hand, we have uh, no uh, evidence that dark matter is a particle. And in principle, as you can see, it behaves as a fluid. All right. so. Uh, the question now is, uh, where is uh, if dark matter is made of, uh, of particles, uh, where are we going to see deviations from the perfect fluid? And uh, basically, all dark matter particle candidates uh, predict some dumping of scales uh, due to quantum effects. And those quantum effects can vary depending uh, on the model. But uh, this truncation is predicted by all uh, particle models. Uh, the scale or the energy where this uh, truncation arises it mainly depends on the dark matter particle mass. And the thing you can see here at the bottom is that for cold dark matter with particles with masses of the order of giga electron volts, and we expect the truncation to happen on scales of parsecs, which are very small in astronomical terms. So people go back to redshift 60, for example, the coupling time, and then they calculate what is the mass, the dark matter mass enclosed within this volume, within the scale, and what they find is that uh, that mass is of the order of 10 to minus six solar masses, which is of the order of the uh, planet, like the planet Earth. So this mass scale is where you would expect a, a, a very strong suppression of uh, structures in the universe, right? Below 10 to, six minus, uh, 10 to minus six solar masses, we should uh, not expect uh, any subhalo in these models. Uh, so when people uh, adopt uh, the power spectrum we saw before, and uh, CMB power spectrum, assume dark matter behaves as a perfect fluid and then carry simulations, like uh, this one is Aquarius, is one of the best simulations of the dark matter halo of the Milky Way with five, 10, 29 particles. What they find uh, already a few years ago, and we were talking before about getting old, so this simulation is already 12 years old. And what they found, Folka and, and their colleagues and his colleagues was uh, a lot of substructure, a lot of substructure in our halo. 
And more interestingly, when people, when they zoom in in, in SAP structure, what they found is the SAP halos uh, contain themselves uh, SAP halos. So this is what we call the SAP SAP halo hierarchy. And if you, you could do the same thing and zoom uh, uh, in one of these SAP, SAP SAP halos, and then you will find SAP 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 halos. And this hierarchy just uh, repeats itself very much like a fractal all the way down to the free streaming of the Damato particle. Okay, so another interesting result from the Aquarius collaboration was this, uh, is the uh, mass spectrum of those subhalos I showed you before. It seems to uh, have a very, very tight power law, uh, dn dn goes like m to minus two. And if you see here with this Aquarius simulation uh, resolution, so this is the poorest resolution, A5, this is the best resolution, A1. What happens is that the A5 only resolves subhalos all the way to 10 to, minus, uh, to 8 solar masses. The best resolution allows uh, you to find more structures, which goes all the way to 10 to the 5 solar masses. But uh, something that to bear in mind is that this is still many orders of magnitude below. Uh, structures in these simulations and uh, so well you can see here the number if you extrapolate the Aquarius oh, sorry so if you extrapolate the Aquarius uh, mass function uh, to the free streaming length mass then you find you this simulation would predict of the order of 10 to the 15 uh, substructures in the Milky Way halo in the Milky Way halo so this is 10 10,000 times more than stars Visible substructures, uh, what we call satellites, uh, occupy only halos with above 10 to the 8 solar masses. So the area within this curve is really tiny. And the rest are dark and only interact through gravity. So 10 to the 15 subhalos is really an upper, uh, sorry, it's, it's really a, lo a lower limit because if you uh, consider particle masses above GeV, and people nowadays consider even TeV, then you, this, uh, this uh, truncation moves to the left uh, to even 10 to minus 12 solar masses, the masses of asteroids, and this number becomes very close to Avogadro, Avogadro number. So this is the prediction from CDM really, is that uh, you know, at some point uh, <laughs> we, we have to think of the dark matter halo like, almost like uh, people think about uh, molecules in a gas, right? So, so, so this is a big challenge. To, to our theoretical understanding of the, of the Dharma Halo. All right, so, so this talk, I will try to answer very briefly these three questions. The first question is, do micro halos, these 10 to the minus x, uh, six uh, solar masses halos, alter the dynamics of visible systems? This is an important question because uh, if the answer is yes, we, we might hope to put constraints on the Dharma particle energy or mass. Um, and the question would be like very much like in particle physics, how sensitive are we to what energy range can we actually test the perfect fluid model? You know, um, that's not clear. And finally, what are the best observational systems to put constraints on the, on the truncation of the mass spectrum, subhalo mass spectrum? So what I'm going to show today is actually very old work that I, uh, I retook a couple of years ago. And this goes back to Chandrasekhar. He published three papers in 41. What he did was uh, very interesting, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, so what he did was to, first of all, write the, down the uh, question of motion of a tracer particle, so massless particle, moving in a clumpy potential. And uh, so the, the first thing he did was to divide the potential into a smooth mean field component, plus uh, these uh, uh, little forces induced by all these individual substructures, okay? So n in these models is very large, it's much larger than one. Then he defined this combined force, which is just the sum of the individual forces of the subhalos. And in his work, he considered point masses. But what I did in 2018 was to extend Chandrasekhar theory to extended objects. And a very convenient uh, object uh, is a uh, Henquist spheres because the modification of a point mass is quite trivial. The only thing you do is to add this size, which I'm going to denote with uh, C in this work. So point masses, Chandrasekhar work is recovered when you set C, C equals zero. 
Okay, once we wrote down this, uh, the first uh, question is uh, that Sander Sekar answered was, what is the spectrum of force fluctuations, right? Because each individual force depends on the relative location of the particles. These particles move, so the relative location changes with time, and that causes fluctuations in capital F. So you can calculate the spectrum of force fluctuations. This is uh, based on the work that Holtzmark in 1999 uh, did. So this paper is really beautiful. He was investigating the motion of charged particles in a plasma. So what Chandrasekhar did was to basically change the, the electromagnetic forces by gravitational forces and everything can be used again. So I did the same thing, but instead of using, of deriving this equation for you, which I don't have time for, for doing that, it's very elegant though, uh, and, but I don't have time. So I'm going to show you an experiment that shows how, how the, this spectrum arises. So in this experiment, you're going to see a tracer particle in a circular orbit. You are going to see how the combined force fluctuates here with time. And here I'm going to calculate the histogram of forces. So this is what is going on. So very quickly, there is departure from the circular orbit due to the perturbations of these little dots, which are our substructures. As expected, the, the combined force fluctuates uh, randomly around some mean. But what you see here is that the spectrum of force fluctuations is static. So, and this is the, what we call the whole smart distribution, right? Uh, so this distribution is static because uh, these objects, the dots are in dynamical equilibrium. So this is what we call the whole smart distribution, P of F. Okay, and something interesting to see is that actually you see the maximum forces experienced by the tracer particles keeps rising, right? So this is an important uh, observation. We'll come back to this. All right, so as I said, what I did was to repeat a Holtzmark derivation, this time for uh, Henquist spheres. Yeah, it's interesting because you get an analytical variance here. It's just the second moment of the distribution, which is proportional to the mass of the substructures squared times the number density divided by the size. So you see that immediately that Chandrasekhar had a problem because for him, he was using point masses. So the variance for point masses diverges. But for extended objects, there is no issue. The, the theory is, uh, doesn't contain any, any uh, divergence. All right, so this is for forces. Now we know the mass spectrum of uh, subhalos, and we know the, how the size and the masses are related in, in colder matter. So we can model that as a simple power law here. And because this is a linear theory, we, we just need to average the variance, right? So when you average the variance, with these mass functions and size functions, but you get another power law with an index three plus alpha minus beta. So if you substitute alpha here, minus two, and beta plus 0 0.5, what you find is that three plus alpha minus beta is 0 0.5. This is a positive number, which means that, you know, here the, the variance is dominated by this term, the maximum subhalo mass. So the fluctuations are dominated by massive subhalos. And this was very bad news at the time when I got this result after so much work, because basically it was telling me that the truncation is invisible. We, we have no access to M1 if we use forces. But what I did was uh, basically not give up uh, so easily. And then I look at the tidal forces, which are the derivative of the forces. So in this case, we, we are not interested in single tracer particles. We are uh, dealing now with self-gravitating objects. This is, for example, a binary star. Now what we are interested in the equation of motion is the relative separation between the binary uh, particles. Then you have the self-gravity of the pair. You have a smooth tidal tensor from the external potential. And then you have another noise term, fluctuating tidal tensor. And this fluctuating tidal tensor, as I say, is just the derivative of the combined forces I was showing you before. Now there is a problem here before I could use Holtzmark derivation. Uh, I had to isotropize these forces, right? Because you know, Holtzmark uh, method is very elegant, but it only works if the forces are uh, randomly uh, pointing in random directions. So what I did was to diagonalize basically the, the individual tidal tensors and then isotropize the forces. So I, I defined this combined tidal vector which points in random directions, but it contains the magnitude of the tidal forces. All right, that works very well, by the way, I check, and it's a very good approximation. All right, so again, we can do the same thing as before. Now you have a binary particle subject to uh, random forces from these individual dots in dynamical equilibrium. 
So the combined tidal tensor, sorry, combined tidal force fluctuates, but you see again that something, the Holtzmark distribution arises very quickly. Something interesting here uh, is that the binary tends to gain kin energy, right? So you see that the binary particles are getting uh, less and less bound with time, and eventually now they just become uh, disrupted. So this is a, an interesting, uh, interesting observation because it means that you know binary stars uh, subject to uh, tidal force fluctuations will uh, be disrupted, as it was very well known. All right, so we calculate now the variance of the tidal forces. <clears throat> now it, 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 you get an analytical um, um, equation. Now it's very similar to the force variance, but you might notice here that instead of one divided by size, <clears throat> what we have is one divided by size to the third power. And this is very interesting when I got this result because it's really showing you that tidal forces are much more sensitive to small objects at a, give, at a fixed mass. So this is uh, very promising when I, when I saw this. And indeed, when you combine the mass and the size functions, what well, you get is another power law, but now the exponent is, uh, the index is three plus alpha minus three beta, which is negative, which means that this variance is now dominated by uh, the smallest, uh, the smallest appeals, the truncation of the mass spectrum. So this was really great news, right? This was uh, made my day at the time. Okay, the final bit, this is uh, the most difficult part now, is to understand how to use those force fluctuations to uh, basically describe the motion of tracer particles or self gravitating particles. So this was the first step to get the spectrum of force fluctuations. Now the problem here is that if you, con you have to know the, the effect of, the, of these uh, forces, you need two times, right? You need uh, t equal t1 and t equal t2, and the problem is that at a later time, the location of these objects is not random because the, these subhalos follow trajectories. So it means that uh, instead of uh, multiplication here, what you have is a convolution of this spectrum. And this mathematically, as Sandrika showed, is quite uh, difficult. I wouldn't recommend anyone to, to try this approach. It was uh, mathematically, it's, it's quite a nightmare. So thankfully, Chandrasekhar, also in 1941, uh, proposed a third method, which is the one I'm going to use, where he said, you know, tracer particles subject to force fluctuations are going to undergo a random walk in velocity space. And that's a huge simplification. It's a beautiful idea, because basically what happens now is that the, the probability to experience a velocity kick is just a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian probability function. And the only thing we need to do is to compute two coefficients, the, the drift coefficient and the diffusion coefficient. So the drift coefficient is zero by symmetry if you are dealing with an isotropic distribution of substructures. So that's easy. The second coefficient, the diffusion coefficient, is the one that is difficult to calculate. So these uh, brackets denote average over the uh, P of F, the, the, the probability of experience and a given uh, lambda, sorry, P of lambda. All right, so here you see it's a complicated expression. Yes, uh, so I'm going to rush a little bit. So, so you can solve this, um, this equation uh, analytically uh, under certain cases. So first of all, you have here the fluctuation mean life. So I cannot explain how, how this is calculated. It goes back to an idea from Smolowski in, in 1916. It's a very elegant one. Um, but basically, for small separations, it's telling you that the fluctuation mean life is just the time that a given subhalo takes to cross this radius. And so it's, a, it's a divided by the velocity of the, the mean velocity of subhalo. So it, it's simple. The second component was uh, derived by uh, Weinberg in 94. Is the, uh, um, this is a correction, it's an elevated correction to the energy absorbed by binary stars, for example. Uh, so binaries with very high orbital frequencies absorb less energy from the fluctuating tidal field. And this coefficient takes that into account. So moving forward, what we found is you have to solve this integral, which you can do in these two limits, when either for binaries with very or, uh, low orbital frequencies or binaries with very, sorry, with very high orbital frequencies. These are the tightly bound binaries or loosely bound binaries with very low orbital frequencies. So we are interested in this one, in the impulsive regime. These are low, loosely bound binaries. And again, something familiar arises. Again, GM square arises in the equation. And now we have a size square in the denominator. So 
Indeed, this is going to be in between what I showed you before, when you integrate the, the mean and velocity kicks and that the tracer, oh, sorry, binary stars are going to kick and get. It's another power law with an index three plus alpha minus two beta, which in this case is very close to zero. So zero means a logarithmic divergence, <clears throat> where the, the variance of the velocity impulses grows like logarithm of one divided by the truncation of the mass spectrum. But you might see here, you are very, very close to either diverging or converging uh, power um, uh, functions here. So let's take one step back and see, are we really allowed to extrapolate this mass uh, and this size function in particular to masses of 10 to minus 16, right? So this is what we are doing really. We are assuming that it's a power law all the way down with an, this exponent. But we are neglecting a scatter, and I think this this uh, this is very much unknown. I'm not very confident uh, uh, on these extrapolations, really. So I would say that CDM cannot make very strong predictions unless we find out what are the masses and the sizes of uh, subhalos with planet size, uh, some planet uh, with this kind of mass scales. All right, but still we can use this beautiful theoretical, uh, sorry, statistical theory to construct the Monte Carlo simulations where we are going to sample velocity kicks from a Gaussian and it really doesn't get more, much more simple than that in statistics. So this is a super, super efficient way of, of mimicking the effect of substructures. And I've tested that. I can show you the, the results of test against direct uh, force calculations if you want. But for now, this is my uh, last slide or penultimate slide. Uh, just to show you this experiment, this is a planetary disk composed of tracer particles on circular orbits moving in a plane, right at t equals zero. You are going to see here the set component of the angular momentum and the energy of these particles. And this is what happens when you, when, when you introduce these velocity fluctuations, the velocity kicks. So what happens to this planetary disk is that it heats, uh, heats up in the radial direction and in the vertical direction. Very quickly, you see these red dots, which are uh, particles, say it could be comets on retrograde orbits. And you see also that the, something like an orc cloud starts to arise as well. These are particles moving on uh, basically isotropic orbits, uh, which are almost like a cocoon around, uh, forming a cocoon around the, the central uh, potential. But this uh, Oort cloud, if I may call it like that, then vanishes with time just because there is evaporation going on all the time. So there are particles crossing to positive energies. So Avi might, might like this result because it's showing that basically something like the solar system, this process must be going on. We must be shedding some comets uh, of the Oort cloud to the uh, interstellar medium and vice versa. We might be in, uh, you know, getting some comets from other uh, stellar systems uh, onto our system. So, okay, so this is enough. Um, so this is just uh, with uh, the theory, you can compute the escape rate and basically what shows is that uh, you can connect now the escape rate of the, of the uh, comets to the mass and the sizes of the perturbers, which is very nice as well. And of course, this is just predicting that some uh, stars will be naked, they will be void of uh, cometary clouds if they are embedded in clumpy media. All right, and that's a structure, of course, when it has evaporation. So we might hope to use uh, cometary clouds around planetary systems to put constraints on, on dark substructure as well in the future. All right, so this is my summary. Sorry if I, I went a little bit over time. So um, hopefully you, you like this, uh, this um, statistical theory, which is uh, based on some Sekar work in 1941. <clears throat> Thanks to this um, uh, theory, now we have a Monte Carlo method to sample velocity kicks, which can be implemented in body or hydro simulations at basically no cost because we are drawing from a Gaussian, velocity kicks from a Gaussian. It's also a linear theory, so you can very easily combine the effect of other perturbers like stars, molecular clouds, and matches. And uh, you can apply this to the best uh, systems to apply these methods. It would be to loosely bound objects like uh, uh, or clouds, uh, but also white binaries, moving stars, stellar clusters, or even ga gas cores. I think this would be very interesting to see whether these, uh, these fluctuations can remove many of the uh, faint event of the stellar <clears throat> populations. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jorge.
this was very nice. Um, and if we are to judge by the number of questions your talk um, inspired on our Slack channel, I think, yeah, this definitely shows that you're still being creative and therefore young as uh, um, <laughs> discussing at the beginning. This is 41 papers, right? So 1941. So. <laughs> um, so to keep kind of a, a theme going on, there are a couple of questions dealing with um, uh, distribution of substructures. And so I'll start on the kind of small scale that uh, Harshil Kamdar asks, how difficult would the same calculations be for a non-isotropic distribution of substructures? Ah, much more difficult, I think. Unfortunately, to derive the, the power spectrum, sorry, the P of F or P of lambda, the spectrum of force fluctuations. And so you do that basically in Fourier space. And so if, if you drop the assumption of uh, isotropically distributed objects, then it becomes much harder. And so that's why Chandrasekhar used completely different technique to derive dynamical friction, although the, the ideas were very similar and you, you find many common ingredients, but the, the, he had to drop this approach, the, the approach that I was showing you today. It's not, it's not very good for an isotropic object. Okay, so that, that's kind of what happens on a small scale. And, and Avi then had a sort of uh, like an independent question, but it might be related to a more global distribution of, of subhalos. And uh, so he brought to our attention, of course, that the uh, subhalos are being disrupted in the inner parts of the galaxy preferentially. And so yeah. Avi was wondering uh, that that might happen before they, they managed to, to disrupt the white binary. So the question really is about the, uh, the timing which occurs first, the uh, kind of disruption of uh, solar binaries or the tidal disruption of, of subhalos in the inner parts of the Milky Way. Yeah, I will show you, if I may, a flash, a very one slide from my student who showed, Rafael Errani, you might know him, who showed that basically the, if you are dealing with Caspi Dharma de Halos, it's impossible to disrupt them by tide. So these are, these are simulations that follow the evolution of a subhalo, you know, for, for several giga years. And you see here the evolution of the mass enclosed within the R max. So this is, a, so this is a quite severe mass loss. You see you, in these simulations, basically what we found is that the mass evolution of subhalos uh, on a fixed orbit is uh, basically exponential. It never goes to zero. And this is just because the inner, uh, the inner regions of a Caspi halo react uh, adiabatically to external tidal fields. So that, that was the reason. So, so I think those subhalos should be around the solar system if they are uh, Caspi. Okay. Uh, then there is also more questions about the the sort of free screaming scale uh, for each dark matter mass. So Julian Munoz asked, what assumptions go into determining the free screaming scale for each dark matter mass? Do you have to assume uh, some thermal history in the early universe? Yes, I think that's what, I mean, I'm not a really an expert. I just uh, briefly look at those papers, but that's exactly what they are doing. They basically calculate what is the distance travel uh, with a given for a given velocity, and that velocity com comes from the thermal distribution uh, of dark matter particles, and then you know that gives you a scale. That, so that basically was in, in those equations, mm -hmm. roughly. I'm sure it's much more 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 complicated than that, but <laughs> that's the idea. Okay. Um, and as we're kind of wrapping up uh, the the Q and A, I wanted to ask a couple of questions that are kind of applying this uh, further on. And, and first is from Morgan McLeod, who has, um, if you could talk about how we might apply this theory to the statistics of binary black hole orbits in dense stellar systems, uh, could they be affected by similar distributions of kicks based on the masses and relative velocities of their perturbers? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, um, this uh, so here I'm assuming that the, uh, so for the forces, I'm assuming a tracer particle. So in principle, any particle will be subject to the same <clears throat> distribution of velocity kicks in the, the thing is that some, for some very hot systems, those velocity kicks are com completely inconsequential. Whereas for very cold objects, those are the loosely bound ones, then those velocity kicks do matter. So that's why we, we should go for the, for the loosely bound one, objects. Mm -hmm. 
and and as a final question very much out there so you're and it touches upon the org cloud uh, and you showed the effect of uh, those fluctuations on kind of, uh, the objects formed in the galaxy and now we uh, we have sent one of our uh, spacecrafts into that sort of territory so i was wondering like would you care to speculate uh, I have no. like in the future missions, like is there like some instrument that would be helpful? <laughs> like yeah, in I really, really wanted to put a student on because it would be such a beautiful project. And actually I would not send one one uh, one um, one mission but two. You know, I would love I would love to send two in different directions. Mm -hmm. Because as we saw, the derivative of the forces is what contains the information on, on the small scales. So I think sending two would be much more clever, but I have to work on the idea a little bit. <laughs> okay. It would be a really, really fun project to do. I think, okay. I think it's going to be really interesting to, to see what happens to those crafts. <laughs> 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 awesome. This is, yeah, I think this is just so great that we, you managed to connect uh, the dark sector with my mother. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with the ore clouds. That's, that's, that's excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jorge. There are a few more Probably. questions uh, on Slack, so please stick around. And yeah, uh, All right. and the speakers. Thanks Thank so you much. Again. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, thank you again so much. And um, let me. Uh, transition us to our second talk. Our second speaker is Kishala Day, and um, who is a graduate student at uh, Caltech, and we can see your screen. That's great. Um, and um, he's uh, advised there by Mansi Kasliwal, and he's over the past years really become one of the leaders of the field of following up and discovering optical and infrared transients. And in, in particular is focusing on sort of the um, growing abundance, I guess I would say, of transients that we're realizing can come from accreting compact objects in binary systems. And uh, so today we're going to hear about um, sort of peculiar thermonuclear supernovae. And uh, welcome, and we're really grateful for having you here, Kishala. Thanks. Thank you for that kind introduction. So um, yeah, so I'm starting my fifth year as a, as a grad student at Caltech and I wanted to talk a bit about some, um, some of my recent work in uh, finding and characterizing very large samples of nearby supernovae and what that is telling us about the fates of helium accreting white dwarfs. So um, I'll start off with this plot, which I imagine you, many of you have seen before, which is the phase space of optical transients. On the y-axis is the peak luminosity of the, of the transient in absolute magnitude. On the x-axis is the characteristic time scale. So back in 2005, there were essentially just oh, three classes of objects. Can I just like interrupt? I see yeah. like on the, uh, the right hand side of your screen, the build order window. Oh. Uh, wait. I'm not sure, sure like if others see that too. Uh, okay. That is strange. Uh, let's see if this. Um, is that? Do you still see that? Morgan, do you do you see that? Okay. I do. There's there's a gray window with like the. I don't know. Just, oh, uh, maybe I should. Yeah. yeah. That. Yes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes, sorry. Um, no, no problem. Uh, right. So, uh, like I was saying, uh, so back in 2005, there were essentially just three classes of transients the classical novae, the core collapse supernovae, and the thermonuclear supernovae, which live over here. But as white field surveys came online with a variety of cadences, we soon realized that this was definitely not the entire story. And for the purposes of this talk, the phase space that I'm most excited about are things that live over here, which are fast and faint transients. And in 2011, it was you know, well understood that this phase space was, is not empty for sure. And, but the number of objects in this phase space were really small at the time. So that there were a lot of questions about where these might be coming from. But today we live in a, an era where white field surveys can not only show that the space space is not empty, but uh, routinely find them at a rate that allows you to do demographics of these transients and relate them to other types of objects. And uh, the one thing that is perhaps very interesting is that these things lie very close to the faintest thermonuclear supernovae that we know of. So early, right from early on, it was suspected that these might be extremes of thermonuclear supernovae that were not recognized in previous surveys. 
So um, uh, I wanted to give another introduction to what the canonical picture for thermonuclear supernovae has been. The canonical picture is that you have a hot white dwarf that's secreting material from a non-degenerate companion, could be a main sequence star or a red giant. And at some point, uh, the white dwarf reaches the Chandrasekhar mass, it explodes uh, and produces a supernova. But I think it's safe to say now that we, it's, it's now very obvious that this is not the correct picture. Uh, there are definitely, uh, mo most type 1a supernovae do not appear to be coming from this scenario, both from very early time and late time observations. And uh, that naturally leads to the question of what uh, produces these thermonuclear supernovae. Are these even coming from single degenerate systems or do you have two white dwarfs that are merging into each other and producing these objects? Whether the explosion happens at the Chandrasekhar mass or sub Chandrasekhar mass, and uh, especially if it's a sub Chandrasekhar mass, what is the trigger for the explosion? So uh, because Chandrasekhar mass explosions don't work, I wanted to talk about uh, you know, sub Chandrasekhar mass explosions, which is really what's uh, picking up in the last few years. And one of the really common uh, uh, pathways in stellar evolution to get to sub Chandrasekhar mass explosions is one that involves two lo low mass main sequence stars. So you start with two uh, low mass main sequence stars, you undergo some common envelope evolution that produces a tighter binary with a white dwarf and a main sequence star around it. And then uh, uh, undergoing another common envelope evolution, you can end up with uh, a CO white dwarf that's either orbiting a, a, a helium burning star or a CO white dwarf with a, another helium white dwarf around it. And uh, you know this is a very uh, well-known uh, sequence in evolution because you know there's, there's so much of rich physics in uh, phenomena and phenomena in this you know right from the common envelope phase which you don't understand very well to accretion and outflows and so on. And what happens from near on is uh, really a, a is a sort of a competition between uh, gravitational waves trying to pull the system in together. And uh, uh, you know eventually the two white dwarfs the, uh, the two objects come into contact. And from here on, it really is a, uh, is, is a battle between gravitational waves trying to pull the thing together and stellar physics that's trying to pull it, uh, you know, throw it out. So, um, uh, you know, the point that I wanted to drive home is that the reason this scenario is really popular is because uh, there are many avenues to explosions in this scenario. So here I'm showing a, 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 a popular plot of the mass loss rate as a function of the orbital period for as, as the system evolves. So if you have two white dwarfs, the system comes in, comes in because of gravitational wave radiation. And as soon as it goes into contact, the accretion rate jumps up. The first avenue to explosion is right over here. If you have unstable mass transfer, then the system can merge and possibly produce an exotic explosion. Uh, even if not, uh, as the system starts separating out because of mass loss, uh, below about 10 to the minus six solar masses per year, you don't get stable helium burning. And here, so what you're getting here is a CO white dwarf that's slowly building up a, a helium shell around it. So the other really common scenario which you can get uh, an explosion from is that at some point, the pressure at the base of the shell is going to be high enough that you, you can get an explosion. It could be a helium nova or perhaps even a, something more exotic, a thermonuclear supernova. And um, the, you know, just understanding this phase space of explosions is, a, is perhaps the only probe of our understanding of what really happens to these old low mass stars, uh, in, in, which we see in our own galaxy, you know, even from the point of view of understanding the accretion physics, the gravitational wave sources, which these will be uh, once Lisa turns online. And of course, uh, some of these peculiar chemical nucleosynthesis signatures that we see in some of these objects. So um, uh, the, you know, the, the, this, exactly this helium shell explosion scenario is the reason why these have been long proposed back from the 80s as uh, the progenitors of type 1a supernovae from this so-called double detonation me mechanism. The idea is that you have a CO white dwarf with a helium shell around it. And if you uh, can detonate a shell, uh, detonate an explosion in, in the shell, you can drive an explosion in the underlying core that can produce a supernova. Now, this picture works. It's really elegant in terms of the stellar evolution aspect of it. but uh, in terms of observations, uh, this has had long problems. And the problem is, uh, for, you know, as you can see here, what you uh, get in this cartoon is that you have a supernova that's essentially a burnt carbon core of a white dwarf with a lot of iron group material around it that comes from the burning of the helium shell. So that's essentially the ashes of the helium shell that are left over on top of the white dwarf. And those can uh, you know, produce what I call as you know, quite distinctive footprints of the shell detonation, which we want to look for and understand if these are consistent. So uh, one of the things that comes from having so much of uh, burnt material is that you have a lot of shallow radioactive material in the uh, outer ejecta, and that produces what are the so-called uh, early excesses in the light curve. So here I'm showing some of uh, a model that we used in the, my recent paper that was created by Abigail Polin uh, at Berkeley at the time, where I'm showing uh, an explosion of a 0.8 solar mass white dwarf with a, about a 0.08 solar mass shell around it. And what you see here is that there's this early time excess that's coming from the radioactive decay in the material in the out, out, outskirts of the ejecta, followed by some, something that looks like a normal type 1a supernova. 
And if you increase the mass of the shell, you get a brighter first peak because there's more radioactive material. And in some sense, the, the first peak traces the mass of the shell and the second peak traces the total mass of the system. But what is really remarkable in terms of the, in terms of the observational signatures is that when you have uh, uh, so much of uh, iron group material in the outer ejector, they actually remark remarkably affect the spectra of the object. And here I'm showing uh, another model from Abigail where uh, what I'm showing here is a spectrum of one of these explosions, where what you see is that on the blue, on the red side of the spectrum, uh, you see typical type 1A supernova features. These are silicon two lines, calcium lines. But as soon as you go to short wavelengths and all of the iron group material kicks in, these iron group materials have you know, tons of transitions at blue wavelengths. And the enhancement of that iron group material really affects the spectrum in that you get strong line blanketing signatures. All of the blue flux is absorbed. And this is remarkably different from what we see in normal type 1A supernovae. So a normal type 1A supernovae are really homogeneous at peak, and they really don't show these signatures at all, uh, including the first peak here, as well as the, uh, the, the line blanketing signatures. So uh, naturally, the questions have been, you know, maybe you can make this work if you make the shell really thin so that the, the ashes are not as prominent in the observations. And you know, completely independently, these could be other types of thermonuclear transients that we don't know of, or you know, have been we know of but haven't realized it yet. So you know, just uh, you know, these could be actually just be rare in the universe. But you know, the question that I wanted to answer is, do these shell detonations exist in nature, especially if they're rare objects? So that leads me to my work, which is using the Zwicky transient facility, which is a, a, a white field time domain uh, uh, survey at uh, Palomar Observatory. So the star of the show is the 700 million pixel camera that lives over here. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty small 1.2 meter telescope with this you know, 47 square degree field of view. And uh, with, a, with a public three day cadence survey of the entire northern sky, we get about 10,000 supernovae per year. Uh, and that's a really large number to, uh, to digest, but we've uh, tried to down select the samples to, uh, to, 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 uh, to do science with it. So my work has been in leading the, the largest volume limited supernova experiment ever done with, with this Wiki transient facility. And the idea is pretty sim simple because this is a wide field survey. What we do is that we take a catalog of nearby galaxies. This is just a known nearby galaxy from SDSS. And we just ask the question, is this transient within a hundred arc second radius of a galaxy that I know of? And if it is, I will just go and take a spectrum of it and classify it. And I do it for every single supernova um, yeah, that, that, that uh, is found in ZTF. So essentially what that does is it builds up a volume limited sample of supernovae within the local universe. And uh, in terms of follow up, our main uh, uh, machine for, uh, uh, for bright transients, things that are brighter than 19 magnitude has been the SED machine spectrograph, which is on the 16 inch telescope at Palomar. And uh, for fainter things, you have to use the historic 200 inch telescope at Palomar. And most of our follow up comes from the Keck telescopes, which can do, go really faint uh, when the supernova gets, uh, uh, especially at late times. So uh, uh, just to give you a sense for the numbers, in the first 16 months, we had 750 supernovae that were spectroscopically classified in, in the first 16 months. And uh, as of you know, last month, we had about double that number, so 1,500 supernovae. And that's just goes to show you that you, know, this, this, you can actually build up very, very large samples of uh, complete samples of nearby supernovae to start looking for the rare events and start relating them to the other populations of uh, supernovae that we generally find in the universe. So, uh, the first surprise came with this spectacular object called SN2018 BYG, which is we found in, in one of our samples. So this is a, a supernova that was found in the outskirts of this elliptical galaxy over here. And it was found relatively early on because ZTF was observing the field every single night. So that we have a very nice early time light curve. You can see this fast rise and it peaks and then it fades away. Um, but uh, you know, it doesn't look very spectacular from the light curve, but the spectra is really what seals the deal. Um, so when we took a look at the spectrum, this is what it looks like. So on, in black here, I have actual data observed uh, for this uh, supernova. Uh, this is about 10 days before peak. This is about at peak. And the red and green are actual models uh, that were created by uh, uh, Abby Polin for uh, this particular scenario. And what you see here is these classic signatures that I was mentioning before, which is the strong line blanketing signatures in the blue part of the spectrum, which I think before this, there were absolutely no other uh, supernovae that showed these signatures. And that really comes, goes to show you the power of big samples and finding rare objects and telling you uh, how, the, how the universe works. And um, so we were able to show that this, 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 this um, uh, signature that you see here is the sh evidence of the shell detonation, and that uh, actually holds uh, together pretty well even when you compare the light curve. Because when what we sh what what I showed was that this early fast rise 
is exactly what you expect to see from the shell detonation scenario, from the radioactive material decaying in the outer ejector. And then you can explain the rest of the light curve with a, uh, uh, with a, uh, a relatively massive white dwarf. So in this particular case, we showed that this was a shell detonation that involved a 0.15 solar mass shell on a 0.75 solar mass white dwarf. And in my mind, I think this is the first one the, where we have you know, the, the smoking gun signature of uh, this shell detonation. And since then, there have been a couple more objects which, are, which are, uh, appear to be somewhat of cousins of these objects, although they, I don't think they show uh, as striking signatures as this one. But I think this, 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 this really opens up a completely new thing to show that these shell detonations for sure exist in nature. So uh, one of the questions that you might ask immediately is, you know, that, that I was wondering about is this object was relatively bright at peak. So it suggests that it's a relatively massive white dwarf because that's what controls the total nickel yield in the explosion. And what we're able to show now is that these explosions exist for sure, but these are relatively rare, about 1% of the type 1a supernovae that we find in the universe. And uh, the natural question that, uh, you know, leads you to, uh, that you lead to is, you know, whether these lower mass white dwarfs with helium shells also explode or do they explode as other types of transients that we haven't figured out yet? So this leads me to a class of transients that has been known for, I think, 10 years now, but I think the origins have been quite uh, mysterious. So these are the so-called class of calcium rich transients. Uh, they were first found in the Lick Observatory supernova search, where uh, uh, the, I think the really the remarkable part about these objects was that these turned out to be these type 1 BC supernovae in the outskirts of early type galaxies. And if you think of type 1 BC supernovae, the canonical picture has been that these, are, these uh, uh, explosions show helium lines in them, helium silicon lines. And the canonical picture is that these come from exploding massive stars, because uh, that's where we find them, and mostly in star forming galaxies. But this appeared to be a completely different population of events that looked like type 1 BC supernovae, except they were systematically appearing in the outskirts of early type galaxies. And that, I think, is really the most remarkable part, uh, showing that this is a separate class of explosions. And since then, uh, PTF went on and found a few more objects. Uh, this is a, a paper from a paper that I wrote compiling the PTF sample. And uh, essentially, these have relatively homogeneous light curves. They rise in about 10, 15 days, and they fade away relatively quickly. That allows us to estimate that there are about you know, half a solar mass of ejecta in these explosions. And the numbers are really, really small. At least uh, as of 2018, there were 10 known events. Um, and that really uh, precluded a, you know, a, a systematic analysis of what the demographics were telling us. Uh, the reason they get their name as calcium rich events is because if you look at them in the nebular phase, when the uh, supernova ejecta become optically thin and you can see right into the core of the explosion, they show these remarkably strong calcium lines we don't see in other types of supernovae. And the consensus, at least early on, was that maybe they might be producing a lot of calcium in the ejecta, which is interesting from the chemical nucleosynthesis point of view. But I think uh, you know, nowadays there's a uh, you know, there's, uh, it's, it's unclear whether that's really the case or if it's just, uh, uh, just uh, the calcium being easily excited. So um, uh, the reason why the entire calcium picture is uh, interesting from the point of view of sub Shikha mass explosions, and I'll just give a broad uh, cartoon here, is that when you go to smaller white dwarf masses in sub Shikha mass explosions, you get lower central densities, and that leads to, uh, uh, to more incomplete burning to intermediate mass elements as uh, compared to iron group elements that you see in type 1a supernovae. And this was suggested right early on from the, when the first objects of this class were found. So uh, I'm just to uh, demonstrate this, I'm showing some recent models from, uh, again, from Abby, where, where she showed that uh, you know, when you go from relatively massive white dwarfs to relatively low mass white dwarfs, you get a transition going from uh, ejecta cooling primarily via iron lines to ejecta cooling primarily via calcium lines. And that you know, just gives you hints that, that this helium shell detonation scenario might actually be a natural pathway in stellar evolution to explain these calcium rich transients. So with ZTF, we, uh, we wanted to you know, really you know, completely change this field by systematically looking for these events. And in one year, in the first year of ZTF, we found eight new events. Just to compare, you know, there were 10 events known in the 10 years prior to ZTF. And in, in the first year, we found eight new events. So that really doubles the sample of events that, uh, that we can get from a systematic large samples like these. The one thing that I'd like to point out is that these all appear in the very far outskirts of early type galaxies, which I think is really fascinating and really drives home the point that these must be coming from really old populations, regardless of how you find them. And uh, with this bigger sample, because ZTF is now giving us uh, light curves and we can get rapid follow-up, uh, this uh, I'm showing here uh, some high cadence light curves that we got from ZTF and follow-up here. In, in, our, in, in red points are the R-band light curves from ZTF, overplotted with some uh, 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 older objects from PTF. These are in gray. 
Um, and uh, what I think is a really tantalizing signature from all of these light curves is that in, in a substantial fraction of these, we see these early time uh, bumps in the light curve, which is exactly the signature that I was mentioning that might indicate that there is radioactive material in the outer ejector. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have exquisite data at those early times yet, because you know, now we are just uh, trying to fi uh, figure and uh, realize this. But hopefully at you know, some point in the future, we get you know, a really good data set that has early time spectra, and then we'd really be able to say whether uh, the, the signatures are consistent with the shell detonation scenario. But regardless, because we have a much larger sample now, what I was able to show is that uh, there is really a continuum of objects going from the from faint thermonuclear supernovae to this class of helium-rich uh, transients that look calcium-rich in the late time spectra. So the, the spectral features that uh, I'm talking about are the helium lines in the, in, in the spectra, as well as the silicon lines that we see in type 1a supernovae. And essentially the continuum is that you go from events that look like type 1a supernovae that have strong silicon lines to things that look like type 1c supernovae that have weak silicon lines and weak helium lines to events that have weak silicon lines and really strong helium lines. And there's a continuum of uh, objects in between these two. And uh, in the same sequence, we see a continuum of uh, properties going from in, in the light curves as well. The type 1a supernovae are relatively slow and luminous. Uh, if you go to further up this change, you, you get light curves that are slow, faint, and red. And as you go up the sequence, you get fast, uh, fast and faint light curves. And together, I think the, the spectroscopic and photometric continuum is really telling us that there is a single family of explosions that explains this. And uh, because we have a, a really uh, a controlled volume limited sample, we can get uh, uh, quite tight estimates on the volumetric rates. We find about 15% of the 1A rate. And if you compare it to the rates of, uh, um, for type 1a supernovae in early type galaxies, they're really common in old environments. There's about one calcium rich event for every three type 1as in early type galaxies. So this, in my mind, really rules out a lot of the exotic channels that have been proposed, you know, things like white dwarf neutron star mergers or white dwarf TDEs, because the rates are way too high. Uh, and I think, and, and with you know, some um, uh, empirical uh, um, uh, modeling of the of the uh, properties of the explosion, I was able to show that this is consistent with a picture where you have all of these explosions coming from uh, helium shells on low mass white dwarfs. So um, uh, the picture that I have uh, that I that uh, is that uh, this is something that we've already demonstrated that if you have a relatively low mass, say 0.8 solar mass white dwarf with a thin helium shell around it, you actually get these calcium rich transients that uh, you know that are consistent with the uh, the observations that we see. But uh, you know, the, 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 the empirical continuum, in my mind, suggests that uh, as you go to lower and lower mass white dwarfs, you get fainter explosions that, can, that, can, that progressively get more and more helium rich. And this is, again, something that uh, needs to be confirmed with modeling. We are trying to do that right now. But I think it, the, the empirical evidence does point to this sequence. And as you get to the lowest mass white dwarfs, you get very incomplete helium burning um, uh, that, looks, uh, that produces uh, spectra that look helium rich. Um, Right, so um, I think uh, just to summarize in terms of uh, directions and the way ahead, I think there's a lot of work to be done into to understand what kind of uh, shell detonations in very old populations can produce this. Is there a problem in the rates? I think the rates are a bit high for a, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, we are uh, working with, you know, Abby Polin is now working on trying to detonate these low mass white dwarfs to see whether we can reproduce the helium and the calcium signatures that we see. In terms of observations, I think uh, in terms of volume limited samples, DESI will be great in terms of uh, spectra of millions of galaxies that will allow volume complete searches. And uh, you know, going ahead with a ZTF2 now coming up with a two-day cadence survey of the sky and LSST on the horizon, we'll get exquisite early time light curves for nearby supernovae, as well as the late time light curves, which will constrain the radioactive isotopes. And uh, finally, the polarization is something which, is, which we're trying to do right now, because these helium shell detonations are intrinsically asymmetric, and we're hoping to get a polarization spectrum soon. Uh, so I will quickly mention something that I got interested in because these uh, uh, extremely fast evolving core collapse supernovae seem to be a common uh, well, false positive in this search process. And here, uh, and I'm happy to talk about this. And this, these explosions tell us a lot about uh, how massive stars evolve in closed binaries. So with that, um, I, I will end here. Um, and I just wanted to drive home the fact that I think the long sought detonation, double detonations for type 1a supernovae are actually hiding in a, in a population of transients that were not noticed before, but they're as common as the type 1a supernovae. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vishai. It was, um, yeah, the numbers you threw around are very fascinating. And uh, there's a, okay, maybe we can start with um, maybe a technical question of, uh, 
assembling all of the resources to, uh, to, to make all of this possible? And, and how have you been coordinating with um, other users of the facilities, especially for the follow-up where I assume the, the timing of when you get the spectra is important. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, uh, so, so uh, like I said, so we, uh, for, in terms of resources at Palomar, there's a 16-inch telescope which allows us to get robotic spectroscopy for the brightest transients. Uh, we, so, uh, in, so I think that the the nominal sequence is that we try to get spectra of sources as close to peak light as possible. So we will try to schedule a spectroscopic observation very close to peak. Uh, for the bright transients, uh, for fainter things, we have to rely on classical observing, which means that I have to stay awake all night and try to get a spectrum of the source, uh, which which is also you know we we have uh, classically scheduled nights maybe every couple of weeks that allows us to you know, keep this sample very complete. We have been very fortunate to get a lot of help from the community as well, because we really we announce all of our transients publicly to, uh, to the online servers, which means that mm -hmm. anyone, if, 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 if there's a transient that we think is a supernova, it's already it's immediately announced to the community and we are able to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, also get a lot of spectra from the community who release it publicly. So that's, you know, I think together that, that has worked out really well in terms of um, uh, getting follow up for these sources. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I know. Like with this, was like hundred thousand, ten thousand supernovae. That's yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, to follow yeah. up. Uh, so we have a, a question, uh, maybe that, that naturally follows uh, from Sebastian Gomez, and saying, um, asking of how often do these transients turn out to be associated with a background source instead of the targeted galaxy? Uh, yes, uh, that, that, that's, a, that, that's a good question. Uh, right, so, uh, so uh, if you remember, so I, uh, I mentioned that, um, that we target uh, uh, all transients within 100 arc seconds of known galaxies. Mm -hmm. And that, that 100 arc second number has really been an experimental trade-off between trying to get rid of type 1As going off in the background and AGN going off in the background and uh, things uh, that are close to the galaxy. Uh, that are actually associated with the galaxy, and I think it. it so I think the the the, the occurrence of uh, uh, background sources is really is a function of the radial distance from the galaxy. The further you go away, it's more likely to be a background source. But let's see. I think uh, I think beyond about fifty arc seconds from the galaxy, you're probably I think more than half of the things that you're seeing are probably background uh, type one A supernovae. But again, because we have light curves from ZTF, it's it's sometimes it's obvious to uh, just looking at the light curves that it's a type one A supernova, but you know, we try to get a spectrum anyway. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, obviously, yeah, you, you need to get it, right? <laughs> to yeah. know for sure. Um, so Morgan then asked, uh, can you talk about the galactic distribution of calcium-rich transients um, in this model where low-mass white dwarfs provide the time delay? And does the galactic distribution match the underlying distribution of these white dwarfs? Or are these objects preferentially kicked? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, yeah, so that leads me to the, uh, to the uh, this is the, the rate problem because, uh, like I said, uh, the, uh, the rates that we find for these objects are about 15% of the type 1A rate. And um, if you and because these are systematically found in the halos of galaxies, that is a bit problematic from what we currently know about the extremely low mass white dwarfs. So this is, you know, obviously work done by Brian Brown at CFA, where uh, they showed that uh, the, uh, the the rate in the halos is about 10% of the rate in the Milky Way, which is which is yeah, that's about 1% of the type 1A rate in the in the halos of galaxies. So that's a factor of 10 off over there, which is my concern in terms of the. Um, the, 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 that's the distributions that there are way too many of these happening in the outskirts. But again, I think the thing that I've been wondering is that, uh, you know, the extremely low mass systems might not necessarily be the only progenitors for these things in the sense that uh, uh, those systems have really low mass white dwarfs, like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 solar mass white dwarfs, which are likely to evolve into stable accreting systems that will undergo, maybe may undergo helium shell detonations. But I think even a possible um, channel, which I think is not known uh, so far observationally very well, is these, you know, the, the, the more massive helium white dwarfs, say 0 0.3, 0 0.4 solar mass white dwarfs that have uh, CO white dwarf companions, there you can, the mass transfer will be unstable at contact, but you could detonate an explosion right at the time of contact. And those, uh, I don't think we have a very good census of uh, what the rates for those things are. Um, because it's just uh, hard to find. So, so, th so that's one aspect of it, which I think that uh, th there is possibly a population of things in our own galaxy that we uh, that could be progenitors that we don't know of very well. 
And the other things that have been, um, have been suggested for a long time are these globular cluster populations, whether these could be kicked out of nearby globular clusters. And um, uh, so we don't really see globular clusters at the positions of these transients, but some uh, recent work from Ken Shen is now uh, uh, is showing that you may not find something exactly at the position of the transient, but you could have you know, something that's you know, just slightly kicked out of the globular cluster, keeps you know, circling around the galactic potential for a few billion years, and then you find it exploding a few, you know, few giga years later. So those, I think, um, the globular cluster population, I think, is another attractive aspect of explaining the offset distribution for these things. Interesting, um, thanks. And to just close it off and to really zoom in into the, the detonation mechanism. So Evan Barr asks um, about the lowest mass calcium rich explosions. Do you think the detonation transitions into the carbon oxygen core or is it just a large helium shell? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great question. I do not. I mean, you know, uh, uh, to be honest, I do not have a, a concrete answer for that. Uh, it does appear that the faintest calcium-rich transients we find also have a lot of unburnt helium, in that we see very strong helium lines in the spectra that empirically suggest that these uh, do not that you know, these do not completely burn the helium shell, and that just suggests that uh, the, the, the helium burning in the shell itself might be incomplete. So in that sense, I, there is an expectation that the faintest objects at least might just be undergoing pure shell detonations where the shell either doesn't burn completely or you know, undergoes maybe something uh, more interesting like a deflagration where the burning is very incomplete. So that's something that I'm hoping uh, will come out of the modeling. I'm hoping this big sample of events really gets uh, you know, the modelers excited about this population because I think that with this big population, we are really starting to see some of the trends which are uh, telling us a lot about where these might be coming from. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really great yeah, to, to see how it's not like all the separate different things, but a continuum. And I had to abbreviate some of the, the questions. So so like they all continued on and it sounds like there is definitely room for collaboration. So please, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for staying with us and uh, yeah, please stay engaged uh, for the CFA people. Thank you for coming and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Thank you to both of our speakers again. Thank you. Bye.